This week, I, when the weather finally got nice and, and, and there was enough room, at least on the sides of the streets or on some sidewalks, to be able to take a walk, I got a really nice prayer walk in one morning this week. And in the midst of that walk, I ran into a man from our neighborhood that, that I've gotten to know some, and, and my bad, I can't even, I, I've talked to him for four years now. He's one of the first people in our neighborhood that I met when we moved in. I don't know his name. But we know each other. We talk to each other probably three to four times a week. And as we got talking this week, which wasn't my plan, I really wanted to get home and get some other things done, but yet there was an appointment from God in this conversation. I've never known exactly where this man's faith was, and I still don't know. But as we talked, the conversation rolled around to the point where he was, was saying some things that, that just opened the door wide for me to be able to express something about the Gospel. And I tried to. And eventually, after a few st- a couple, couple sentences and he responded and I back and forth. He made a statement to me that, that kind of struck and it, it fit perfectly for this illustration this morning. And that is, he made the statement, he says, well, you know, the Bible is filled with very interesting stories, but very little of it relates to us today. And this man is probably about two years older than I am. I know from his Vietnam experience and my Vietnam experience, the differences in our ages. But as he said that, I tried to counter it a little bit in, 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 a, in a gentle way. In fact, one of the things I said to him is, you know, you know this, we've been talking together for, for four years now, I'm not going to shove what I consider the Bible to say or theology down your throat. But I'm going to say things about it. I'm going to express it. I'm going to defend it. And as he expressed this, we got to talking about certain individuals. And, and, and it's funny because he brought up Abraham. He said, the stories of Abraham, he says, very interesting, he says, but it has nothing to do with us whatsoever. And I won't go into the rest of our conversation. I tried to defend what I believed on that because what I'm going to say this morning is that Abraham has a lot to do with us. Far more than what we sometimes recognize. And yet, as I read the Barna polls and the Gallup polls and other things, I admit that our culture today, even within the context of the church, there are many people that don't get the connection between Abraham and us. They kind of say, okay, great story. For many, great fiction. It's not, but that's what they say but they don't get the connection between Abraham and us. And this morning, we are starting a series and and last week's storm, it changed the whole perspective of how I'm going to move forward. I was going to do five Old Testament characters and then I was going to go on vacation. Well, I'm going on vacation, but I'm only going to do four Old Testament characters before vacation Then we're going to pick up again when I get back. But, It says in Hebrews 11, it says in all these, it gives a list. And we're not going to go through that list in our series. We're going to use some of the people in there and we're going to use others that that are just implied in that that list. But all these were commended for their faith and it says something very interesting. And this is the Dijkstra translation of the Greek words that are there. It says, because they encourage us to run the race set before us. They encourage us to run the race set before us. And it says in 2 Timothy 4.8, and this is all introductory, but, but, but grab onto this. Look at this and, and recognize this shows us part of the connection. Because Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, says, finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for it says, all those or all who have set their affection on His appearing. Or as it says at the end of chapter 11 in Hebrews, it says, and all these were commended for their faith, yet they did not receive 
exactly what was promised, and that exactly is a, 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 a clarification of what the terms mean there. They received God's promises, yes, and they received parts of what God promised. But the ultimate promise was Jesus Christ, the Savior that would die on the cross for their sins. And in the Old Testament, they were waiting for that. Yet they did not receive what was promised, for God had provided something better for us so that they would be made perfect together with us. There's a connection. And I think it's important that we realize that the faith of Abraham along with all the other faithful followers of the Lord recorded in the Scriptures. That faith serves as an example for us to follow. We're going to see that in Abraham today. An example for us to follow. A scary example. I was talking with... with one of our leaders earlier this week, and I, I made the comment, I said part of what this lesson teaches is very, very hard to communicate because it is so radical. And to be truthful with you, oftentimes I think we who teach God's Word, we step away from the radical because we're afraid that's going to cause somebody to not like what we're saying. But it serves as an example for us to follow and it's also an encouragement that energizes us. But do we let it energize us? Do we let it spur us on to the point where we say, yes, I want to be like Abraham. And that's a question we have to ask. And all that is because the journey of faith is a long winding relay race. I was looking this week, and apparently I've gotten rid of it. I was a track runner, and somewhere in my stuff before we moved, I had a baton. It's gone. But I was going to grab it and pass it to somebody and say, let's pass that through the crowd today. Because we all are carrying the baton that God gives us in this relay race in which we've been invited to run. And I want us to get a hold of that today. I want us to see that today. And I want us to realize now, uh, I, I did not know. In fact, I thought I'd heard this on the radio even recently, but I didn't because it, well, actually not this one. This one, was, this one according to the, to the government website, is canceled. The new one has a different name. But you remember when, in fact, I remember as a kid, we didn't watch much TV, but suddenly the, the TV would get this, 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 that signal on the bottom and there'd be beeping and they'd say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. It is only a test. Well, I want us to realize that today we are conducting an EBS, a test. This is a test of the EBS based on Genesis 22, Hebrews 11, and James chapter 2. But what kind of a test is it? It's a test of the essential belief system. The essential belief system. And as we look through this study that we're going to be doing over these next few weeks, it's time for a faith in action reality check. It's time for us to take a close look at the content of our faith, yes, but the character of our faith as well. How strong is it? And I ask these questions very briefly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because there's so much good stuff in this passage of Scripture. But the questions we ask, how much does my faith influence my relationships? How I treat people? I know that in my own life, my faith doesn't show every moment of every day. At least I think it shows every day, but it doesn't show every moment of every day. And therefore, sometimes I may not relate to people the way I should. How does it influence my rhetoric? How I express myself, what I say, 
I, I poured myself and I, as I say this, I, I can't help but bring this out. Maybe this will touch somebody today. I poured myself over the passage in Ephesians this week where it said, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. But only things that are edifying, that are building up, that are positive. And, and as I looked at that, I found assurances. I found a sense of, 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 of peace because... I know that that's the direction that God wants us to go. And, and, and I, I just said, God, help me and help all those people around me and people in our world today as I listen to things on the news and everything else to recognize that our faith should affect our rhetoric. How much does my faith affect my reverence? The way that I view God. As this man this week says, well, he even made the statement, he says, well, yeah, God's probably involved in lots of things, but he says, I'm not so sure that he's involved in my life. And then the interesting thing is, is the implication he gave me is, is and I'm not sure I want him to be. And that's a concern that each of us ought to stop and realize. Now, you might be, may remember this from a few weeks ago when we jumped into the book of James. The idea that the book of James and I think the admonition for all of us as followers of Christ is to express your faith in an evident way every day. We should let it be known and let it be shown. And the thing that we look at that then is what evidence will people notice? They'll notice authentic faith that affects our attitudes and our actions. Because our beliefs will drive our behavior and our behavior demonstrates what we believe. Now why do I bring that up? Why am I saying that this morning? First off, the idea express your faith in an evident way every day or express my faith in an evident way every day I bring that up because the question that's been asked of me several times since that series of studies is, how does that work? How does that work? How does it become relevant in my life? What does it mean, express my faith? What's it mean? And that's what this series of studies is going to do, but let me pause for a moment and express a couple of things that I think are relevant to us today. You know, the number one thing that the generation that has walked out of the church, the generations, the two generations that have walked out of the church, the number one thing they say about us is they question the authenticity of our faith. They question whether our faith is authentic. And it's easy for me to look at them and say, well, now you've got a problem, but no, I can look back at myself and say, no, wait a minute, maybe I've got a problem. The authenticity of my faith. Authentic faith will affect my attitude and my actions all the way through. And as I consider how that is continually thrown in our faces, and whether we realize it or not, the dialogue has changed. They've, they've changed from a number of things they say, and I'm not going to get into that this morning. But so much of what's happening in the, the social justice movements in our country today, and I'm not battering them, I'm just stating things that are happening there is that they're questioning, in essence, the authenticity of our faith. So let's dig in and analyze the text of Scripture. Genesis chapter 22, which is the biggest challenge that Abraham ever faced. The biggest challenge that he ever faced. And, and the first thing we see, Genesis 22 verses 1 and 2, I'll read them for us. I don't have it on a screen. I didn't do that today. But it says, now it came about after these things that, Abraham, that God tested Abraham. And He said to him, Abraham, and Abraham responded and said, here I am. And God said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the, the, the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. The test of faith. The biggest test that Abraham ever experienced. 
And it says, after these things, and those are the events in Abraham's life from Genesis 12 through 21. Let me just summarize them quickly. Genesis chapter 2, God gave promise, a promise to Abraham of a son and a blessing that would, that would go for all the world through Abraham himself. God promised that. Then Abraham moved from the land where he lived to a new land, and he got there, and what happened? There was a famine in the land. And that moved Abraham and Sarai to Egypt. And there in Egypt, what did Abraham do? Rather than follow as a faithful individual trusting in God, he lied. He lied about about Sarah, his wife, and he risked his own life and he risked Sarah's life, and yet God helped him to escape. Then Abraham and Lot, he had his nephew with him. They're living together in the land that God had promised and suddenly problems come between the two of them. And they had to separate from one another. Issues developed. Eventually, Abraham rescued Lot from the war of the kings. And he also had to do with Lot being saved from a problem that happened a little bit later in Sodom and Gomorrah. But in essence, God then reaffirmed His covenant with Abraham. Said, God says, Abraham, I've promised to you, and it says in the Scriptures, and Abraham trusted God, and his trust was counted to him as if he were a righteous person. It says that. So these are the things. These are some of the things. A lot of stuff happened from chapter 12 to 21. Right after that reaffirmation of God's promise to Abraham, Sarah gets a bright idea and says, hey, why don't you take Hagar, my slave woman, and take her and have a child with her. And Abraham, he listened to his wife, and Ishmael was born, and then Abraham had a son, but it wasn't the son of the promise. Following that, Abraham's name, Abram's name was changed from Abram to Abraham. Why? Because suddenly, Abram was no longer the father of a nation. He was going to become the father of another nation because this first nation, Ishmael, that wasn't the land of promise. That wasn't the, the, the nation of promise. So it was a name change for both Abram and Sarah. And then, once again, God came to Abraham and promised that Isaac would be born. You're going to have a son. I promise you that. And Abraham and Sarah had some special guests. And it's interesting because the special guests said what was going to happen. It was the angel of the Lord. And Abraham listens and Sarah laughs at the the, the promise. She laughed. Because she says, how in the world is that going to happen? I'm far beyond childbearing stage. The next thing that happened is that Abraham finds out that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed. All this took place in Abraham's life. All these things. And yet, Abraham trusted God and it was counted to him as being a righteous person. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Lot was rescued, but his wife wasn't. Abram and Sarah moved again and once again they developed this this deception that that, that happened and and their lives were put at risk one more time because there was a certain sense where the pressures of the situation caused them to struggle with their trust. Finally, Isaac is born. Once Isaac is born, Ishmael starts making fun of him and Abram decides it's time to remove Ishmael and Hagar from this home. That's chapter 21. We come to chapter 22. And after these things, God tested Abraham. He says, take your only son, Isaac, whom you love, whom is the son of the promise. Take him and offer him as a sacrifice. Now some people say, well, how can that happen? What is that? And I I admit to you, that's something that I cannot fathom in the sense that I don't understand the whys and the wherefores of that except for the fact that God had a plan and a purpose in it. And the end in this case did justify the means. And we'll see that in a little while, but 
you know, he says, take and offer your son as a sacrifice. And what do we find in that? Very simply, very, very clearly stated, this to me, as I look at this story, is the reasoning stage. It's the reasoning stage where we find that God is using different events in Abram's life. All those things that happened, all those events that took place, after these things where God seemed to be testing Abram all along the, 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 the way, it says finally, God had a final test for Abraham. And God uses different events in Abram's life and in our lives to force us to determine, do I really trust God? Do I trust God? Is my faith for real? And let's understand as we look at that aspect of things, we shudder at what happens here. We think, oh, this, this doesn't make sense. This couldn't happen in our culture. But understand, God never puts us in a situation in any fashion where sin, where doing the wrong thing is our only way of escape. God always places us in situations where if we trust Him, He's going to take care of what's going on. He's going to provide for us. Or as we look at it in a few questions, how much does my faith influence the ability that I need to have to trust the Lord with all my heart? And we're going to get to some of the aspects of that in a little bit. But how much does my faith influence my ability to trust in the Lord with all my heart? Or how much does it influence my awareness of how my own personal feelings will fool me? They're going to deceive me. They're going to cause me to think things that I ought not to think. They're going to cause me to go down directions where I shouldn't go. They're going to cause me to think things about other people that I shouldn't think or believe things because you know, something is said and oh no, wow, what's, what's going on with that? The insecurities that we have and all of that. When God writes to us in Proverbs 3, He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You realize that's, that's a command? And my faith should say, okay, I can't let my feelings run away with my fears. I need to be aware that my feelings are going to fool me. How much does my faith influence my acknowledgement that God's in control? Do I recognize that God's in control or does that sometimes become a big question mark in my life? And I jump to Romans chapter 8 for a moment just to, to, to review some Scripture to get our thoughts focused in on things that might help us through the reasoning stage. The reasoning stage is, do I really trust God or not? Where Paul writes in Romans 8.1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are trusting completely in Christ. I don't ever have to worry about being condemned. Or secondly, verse 28, and we know with confidence that God works all things together for good for those who love Him and who are called to His purpose. Or called according to His purpose, as it says in some translations. Or as it says in verse 31 there, if God is for us, who can be against us? And just simply as we draw a conclusion to this point here, how do these truths impress or influence or impact my lifestyle? Is my lifestyle different because God said, I will never condemn you? Is my lifestyle different because He says, I work all things together for good. Even when there are mistakes made. Even when there are, are issues. Next week, one of the things we're going to consider as we look at Saul, Samuel, and, or Samuel, Saul, and David. 
Samuel's following David. We're going to look at what happens when God's permissive will becomes the perspective that we live in. When God's permissive will. When we are falling away from what God's perfect standard is. Because if God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes, that means when I sin, when I do something I ought not to do, God's still going to work the situation out. He's going to work the situation out. And I have to understand that. Does that influence my lifestyle? Now, I realize some people say, well, hey, if God's going to work it out even when I sin, then I can go as do as I desire. That's not the point. But our lifestyle should be affected by the idea that God is trustworthy. And I said I was drawn to a close. I am. I'm going you know, to move on here. Because the next thing we see in Abram's story is the testimony of faith. The testimony of his faith. Verses 3 through 10. And it leaves us hanging at the end of verse 10, but the testimony of faith. The text very simply says So Abram, he rose early and went to the place God said three days away. Secondly, He got there. He's got servants with him. He's got Isaac. He's got wood. He's got whatever's necessary for the sacrifice except one thing was missing. But he says to his servants, he says, you guys stay here. You stay here. And he never revealed to anyone what was going on according to what the Scriptures suggest to us. He said, Isaac and I will go and worship. And he says very clearly in the language of the Old Testament, and we will return. Now, Abraham said that either he was a great liar or he had great faith and said, okay, I know God made a promise and He told me to sacrifice my son, but God's got that all worked out. And this is a statement, I believe, expressing Abraham's faith in God's promises. Next thing that goes on then, it says Abraham took the wood, the fire, the knife, and he went with Isaac. Left the servants behind. They they went farther down the road, up the mountain. They're moving along and Isaac says, Dad, you know what? Something's missing here. I see the wood. I see the fire. But where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And Abraham's response, it says, hey, God will provide for Himself the lamb for the sacrifice. He gave His Son assurances that God would provide without really knowing how God was going to provide. And this is another statement expressing Abraham's faith. He didn't know exactly what God was going to do, but his faith was at work when he believed that God had a plan and a purpose. So the testimony of faith continues as Abram builds an altar, he puts wood on it, and suddenly he grabs his son and ties him up and he lays him on the altar. Can you imagine what's going on? The, the tension, the stress, the questions that are going on at that point. He'd already asked, where's the, where's the lamb, Dad? And it says he reached out his hand and took the knife. He's ready to make the sacrifice. And it says very explicitly in Hebrews 11, verse 17, it says, by faith, when he was tested, Abraham offered up Isaac. Yet he was ready. No, it says he had received the promises, that is, a son. He'd received the great promise that God said, the son. Yet he was ready to offer up his only son. The text says that. And what we find in this, this is the response stage. The reasoning stage is, do I really trust God? 
Am I willing to follow what He told me to do? Am I willing to take this step of faith? Am I willing to say, okay, God, I know that You've got it all put together? The response stage is that God uses events in our lives to force us to demonstrate. To demonstrate that obedience proves the reality of my faith. Obedience proves the reality of my faith. And authentic faith is obedient faith. Authentic faith is obedient faith. And we ask the question, how much does my faith actually illustrate my willingness to do what God's Word says? And, and I'm going to be very, very clear here and express to you that as I look at this, this becomes very, very hard to describe. Because I don't know particularly the challenges that you have in being willing to do what God's Word says. But I think it's important that we realize that our faith will in fact illustrate just how much am I going to say, yes, I'll do what you want me to do, God. Do we recognize that obedience is the primary thing that verifies the authenticity of the confidence we have in the Lord? And when I hear a generation saying to my generation, I question the, the reality of faith. Is your faith authentic? And what I've heard time and time again, in fact, as the studies are revealed what people are saying these days, they're saying that too many times we've been taught what to believe. We've been taught what to believe, but we fail to make it our own. That's what actually a couple of celebrities that we know that at one time claimed to walk as followers of Christ and now they want nothing to do with following Christ, what they've said was, I realized that everything I'd been taught to believe only raised skepticism and doubt and questions in my mind. And what some of them have gone on to say is I lived in a home where we were taught to believe certain things, but I saw the reality of it and that faith didn't show. It seemed to be a facade. And we have to understand that obedience is that primary thing that verifies the authenticity of our confidence in the Lord. We go back to Romans 8. There is therefore, no, no, therefore now no condemnation for those who completely trust or are trusting completely in Christ. It's funny, I memorized these verses years ago and yet for this study today, I took and I translated right from from the original languages what those verses say. And that's why I slipped up because this is a literal translation of those words in in Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are trusting completely in Christ. Or what it says in verse 28, and we know with confidence that God works all things together for good for those who love Him and who are called to His purpose. Or the statement that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Or going a step farther in that same chapter, verse 39, where it says that there is absolutely nothing, nothing at all that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Christ died on the cross... Get the story of Abraham being willing to sacrifice his only son. Does that look like something else we know in the Scriptures? God, in fact, did sacrifice his only son. But he didn't stop before the sacrifice was made. He carried out the sacrifice. What greater love can anyone ever have than that? God loves me that much. And there's absolutely nothing at all that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
So we ask the questions again, but in a different way. How do these truths inspire us? How do they influence our lives? How do they ignite our faith? How do they prompt me to obey what God tells me to do? Or to dig in just a little bit deeper, what hinders my ability to truly obey God? What is it that causes me to question? What stops me from going full-blown into radical faith like Abraham's? That's a hard thing for me to say. Because I too, just like every one of us here today, say, you know what? Do I want to be that radical? What attracts me to take the path that leads to sin instead of the path that leads to submission? What's the attraction there? Well, let's go on and see what the last thing that happens. Because the last thing in this story of Abraham is the triumph of faith. We've got the test of faith. We've got the testimony of faith. Now we have the triumph of faith. The end result. The passage says, but the Lord's angel called to Abraham from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham responded, here I am. I'm listening. In fact, Abraham had the knife up, but as soon as he heard his name called, he figured, good, there's an answer. And the voice from heaven says, don't lay your hand on the boy, for I know that you fear God. And Abraham looked. He says he looked. And behind him was a ram caught by his horns. And what we find there is Abraham said, hey, God will provide for himself a sacrifice. And God provided the sacrifice. It says Abraham took the ram, offered it as a sacrifice instead of his son. And what do we have there? We have a picture of what Jesus Christ is for us. A substitute that took our place when He died on the cross of Calvary. That was supposed to be you and me. But we have a picture of a substitute right here. Because the Lamb took Isaac's place. In this triumph of faith, it says Abraham then called that place, the Lord will provide. God will provide. Some people call that Jehovah Jireh. That's a very loose translation, but that's what they call it. But it's an expression of praise to God just the same. And it doesn't stop there. Because then the triumph of faith takes us to the point where the Lord's angel, he calls again to Abraham. Hey, Abraham, I've got something else for you. He said, here's my oath to you. I'm going to reaffirm what I've promised. And I'm going to show you that it's for real. I will bless you. I will multiply your offspring greater than the stars and greater than the sand. Here's Abraham. A dad with a wife. They're both old in in age. And they have one son. And God says, your your descendants are going to outnumber the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. That's amazing. And He says, and you, Abraham, through this will become a special blessing to all nations. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. And it says simply, because you've obeyed My voice. Because you've done what I ask you to do. And as we look at this triumph of faith, what we see is that the last thing in in the passage is an interesting thing. We can miss it if we're not looking carefully. Because as as Abraham returned then to Beersheba, that's where he lived, where Sarah was waiting for him, 
But then in verse 23 it says, and to his, to his distant relative, or to his relative, Isaac's wife Rebekah was born. And it jumps out of the page if we look at it and say, wow, God is, is, is fulfilling the promise because that's how the start of all the descendants took place. That's the start of it. And yet, they only had two kids. But nonetheless, let's realize God's always at work behind the scenes. He's always at work behind the scenes. He's always doing something. And we may not feel it. We may not see it. We may not know. But we can be assured. We can rest assured. God's always at work behind the scenes. And as we look at this and consider what this is saying, this is the result stage. And understand the result stage sometimes is a distance away for us. But it's the result stage because what it prompts us to realize is that while God used events to, to basically force Abraham to determine, do I trust God or not? He used events to force Abraham to decide, or I mean, force Abraham to de demonstrate this is what my faith shows. This is how my faith is, is evidenced. And finally, he used events throughout Abraham's life and our lives to help us to define. We define for the world around us what we believe God's character to be. We exhibit to the world around us just how great is our... We, the first song we sang, how great is our God. The world doesn't see how great God is sometimes because we don't show them. Amen? God always keeps His Word and fulfills His promises. Always. God always keeps His Word, fulfills His promises, and faithful followers of the Lord... What we are is we are blessed by God to receive the reassurance of His promises when we obey. Why do we not fulfill the, the assurance? Why do we not see the assurance of God's promises sometimes? Because we're not obeying. And again, I can't define all of that for you. I can define it for me. And in my greatest times, I'd say, it doesn't sound so bad. In my worst times, I'm going to say it, and you're going to say, hey, you're fired. Because I'm just as human as anyone else, and I have times when I say, oh God, how in the world do I trust you? And you want to know something? I was nervous about preaching this message today. I was scared. Because what goes through my mind Number one, I have just as many insecurities as anybody else, so that's a factor in it. But number two, the reality is I know that there's a certain percentage of people here that this is going to go in this year and not the other. I don't know who that is, but I know it's out there. There's a certain percentage of people here today that are going to say, well, yeah, wow, that's overwhelming. I, I can't take that. There's some people that listen to it and say, whoa, I realize just how weak my faith is. And you know what? That's not a fun thing to talk about. But faithful followers of the Lord are blessed by God to receive the assurances of His promises, but it comes when we obey Him. We don't see it because we're not obeying to the level that He desires sometimes. And the question is, how much does God's faithfulness encourage my, my ability to trust in the Lord with all my heart? God is faithful. He will never fail to meet a promise. God is faithful and He wants us to be aware of how our feelings are going to lie to us. Our feelings are going to fool us when we lean on our own understanding, we fail to see the greatness of a great God that can do great things beyond what we can ever imagine. And how much does God's faithfulness encourage my acknowledgement that, hey, He's in charge, I'm not. He's in charge, not me. 
And we simply look at James 2, verses 20 through 23. Is Abraham relevant to us today? Yes, because of this. Because of Hebrews 11. Where it says, But would you like evidence, my empty fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not our father Abraham's faith verified by his actions when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Some people are thinking in that study, that story, saying, there's no way that should have ever happened. Can you imagine the PTSD that Isaac had after that? That's what some people are going to say. You see that his faith was working together with his actions and his faith was fulfilled by his actions. And the Scripture was fulfilled with it says, now Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. And as we apply these truths in a personal way to our lives, realize, first off, faith doesn't demand explanations. Why? Why, God? In fact, I heard a story or or, or, or a report the other day. It was on either Family Life Today or or, um, Focus on the Family or maybe one of the others. I don't know which one. But the word was is our current generation that are raising kids, I'm not picking when I say this, I'm, list, I'm quoting what somebody said, is the concept that because I'm the mom and I'm the dad, do it, doesn't work anymore. And people are kind of ignoring that concept that authority matters. But the thing is, in this particular aspect, Faith doesn't demand explanations. It simply rests on God's promises and provisions. God promised and He'll provide. And relies on God's grace and His goodness. God is a gracious God. He saved me in spite of the fact that I don't deserve one iota of that salvation. And His goodness. He not only saved me from the penalty and the power of sin, but He planted His own presence in my life to exhibit goodness that carries me through so that I can do the things we're talking about here. We have more reasons that we can do what Abraham did than Abraham had. Because God's Spirit works in us. So now we ask the question, what is the foundation of my faith? How do I practically apply this to my life? Well, number one, we need to spend time Rather than watching news programs or movies or other things that so often attract us, in fact, somebody made the comment that we had a movie night here to set Friday night for the kids, and somebody says the attendance wasn't so good because people were probably movied out from last weekend. Well, how much time do I spend reviewing the examples of faith found in God's Word? I'm not talking the examples of faith I find in other people. That's good. That's good. But when I review the examples of faith found in God's Word, that's better. How much influence does our society and culture have in my view of God? How many times do I define God by the way that the news programs define God? How often do I define God by the way that my neighbors define God? And how much impact does the reality of God's mercy, grace, and love have on me? As we close off today, just very simply, this is a test Ah, ah, ah. of the essential belief system. It's time for faith in action. Reality check. Let's pray. Father, I, I'm not sure what else to say. I'm just going to quiet down now and ask You work in our lives. Help us take a few moments in silence before I close this prayer to process Abraham's test of faith. 
process, the testimony that he showed, the demonstration that he made, and to recognize the definition of your character, the definition of your faithfulness, your testimony, your goodness, your love, your grace, your mercy, the testimony that shows in the end. Father, help us ponder that for a few moments. And then give me the understanding exactly when it's time just to, to close the prayer and say amen. Please help us to see the areas where we're failing to obey You. Help us to see them clearly so that then we can find the assurances of Your promises, the assurance of Your presence in our lives. And then finally, Father, help us to get a good glimpse of Your faithfulness, of Your love, of what You provided for us on the cross of Calvary through Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrificial love ever. Help us to find assurance in all of that. And I pray that if there's anyone here today, Father, who is struggling with doubt, struggling with questions, if there's anyone here who's never fully trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, help them to grab somebody around them here in this room today and ask for the help that's needed to just follow through in finding Christ for who He is. So thank You, we praise You, and I love You, Father. And I pray your blessing over this whole body today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.